Hi, this is David from Lighthouse Baptist Church, Assistant Pastor, and welcome to our live stream for this Sunday evening. Um, we will be continuing in the book of John, and today we are in chapter 1 and verse number 5 through 7. John chapter, or 1 John chapter number 1, verse number 5 through 7. Uh, and the title of this series is Knowing God. Uh, John deals with the issue uh, in this letter about how we can have fellowship with God, or how we can know God, and how we can know that we know God, um, and how others around us, other Christians, can look at our life and say, yes, this person has fellowship with God. Um, throughout this book, uh, as we talked about last week, remember John is a pastor, and John, um, uh, John has a pastor's heart, and John cares for the souls of the people that are reading this letter. Um, and for the souls of those who would read this letter from that day forward, uh, including you and me. Um, and so as we go through this, although John is going to draw some lines, uh, we need to understand that uh, when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to uh, the preaching of the word of God, uh, there are, uh, when it comes to the, the core truths of, of doctrine and of who God is, who Jesus is, what the gospel is, uh, it's black and white. Um, there is there is truth and there is error, um, and John draws that line throughout this uh, throughout this letter. And but at the same time, because he has a pastor's heart, he takes breaks every once in a while, and uh, he reminds us um, uh, not to worry, but and also not to uh, not to be overwhelmed by these tests, not to be overwhelmed by these things that he's saying. Um, and so uh, I implore you in the same way. Uh, as we draw these lines and we see the black and white and we see the truth and error uh, that, um, remember, we don't say these things to, uh, uh, to invoke fear in your heart or to make you doubt whether or not you're a Christian, but um, it's, it's with the same, um, the same intention as, as John's intention was, and that is to make sure that we know that we know that we know uh, that we have fellowship with God. Uh, what a tragedy it would be for you to live your entire life thinking you know God, but at the end of this life, uh, on the other side of this life, you find out that you actually didn't, uh, that you were believing in some other gospel uh, that was not the gospel of the Bible, that was not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and so that's what we aim to do with this. Although 1 John is very, very much a simple letter, there's a lot of pretty deep theological truths in here. Um, that we can glean from it. So uh, let's continue. First John chapter number uh, one. First John chapter number one, and we're going to begin reading in verse number five and down through verse number seven. First uh, John one and verse number five through seven it says this: This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So this will kind of be a two-part. Um, next week we'll go into those other verses, but First John chapter number one, verse number five through seven is what we're gonna look at. And in fact, if you look back at verse number three, it says this. He speaks of fellowship as we covered last week. Uh, the reason he wrote these words is so that we can have fellowship with God and also with those who also have fellowship with God. Uh, verse number three, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, and these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. So his, his purpose was twofold. And that was uh, one, that our joy would be full to sum, sum it all up. He wanted to share the same joy that he experienced, but also uh, that we would have fellowship with him. Uh, with those that were proclaiming this gospel, that had heard it firsthand and seen it firsthand. Um, he wanted to share that joy with us, but also that we could have fellowship with God and fellowship with others. Uh, and uh, today I want to zero in on this fellowship that John is speaking of. 
and uh, John himself is zeroing in on this fellowship. And in fact, he's going to do that throughout the letter. We're going to we're going to approach a series of tests to uh, to uh, to look inward and and tell whether or not uh, we really know God. Um, and uh, today is it, it will be just like that. So uh, why is it so important that we have fellowship with God? Um, what does it look like? Uh, what's its nature? And how do we know if we or other people have it? Um, how we'll do that this morning is by looking at three verses where John elaborates on this fellowship just a little bit more. Verse number five through seven. Um, I got three points for you this evening and then, and then we'll be done. Three points. The first one is the importance of fellowship. Uh, number two, the nature of fellowship. And number three, the test of fellowship or tests, plural, of fellowship. The importance of fellowship, the nature of fellowship, and the tests of fellowship. Uh, what we'll look at this evening, we'll, it, it's going to be a negative and a positive test. And, but before we do that, um, the first two points are actually introductory. Um, I know we already had our introduction last week, but an introduction to this term, fellowship. What does it mean to have fellowship with God? Uh, so we're, it's going to be a little topical here at the beginning, uh, but we'll get into those ver two verses at the uh, in our last, uh, verse number five through seven at our last point. Um, uh, why is fellowship important? Why does John think fellowship is important? Because fellowship is very much um, integrated. Fellowship with God is integrated into the message of the gospel. Uh, and before we explain the importance of fellowship, uh, we need to have a clear and concise understanding of what the gospel is. Uh, because fellowship or communion with God, specifically our reconciliation with God, being brought back to God, uh, is one of the main purposes of the gospel. Uh, there's so many things that happen when the gospel transforms a life. Uh, when we pass from death unto life, when we become a child of God, when we're adopted, when uh, we become accepted in God's sight, uh, our standing changes, our, um, uh, so much changes. Uh, in fact, the Bible tells us that all things become new. Um, and, but this is one of, the, one of the main purposes of the gospel is to bring us back to God, to reconcile us to God, where we have fellowship with him once again. That fellowship that was broken um, back in the Garden of Eden uh, is restored again through the power of the gospel. And while the core, uh, some, some people listening to this video can have a, uh, a preconceived idea about what the gospel is. And I want to make sure that we're all on the same page so we know what the gospel is. Uh, while the core of the gospel, and Pastor says this so much, and uh, I'm sure it's uh, really dug really deep in our brains. Uh, while the core of the gospel can be summarized as the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the gospel in a nutshell, um, there is an overarching yet concise, uh, overarching, very broad yet concise way to frame the gospel as a whole. Uh, when we're talking about from beginning to end, from creation uh, to the end of time, there's there's an overarching uh, gospel um, that we need to understand. So the gospel is the good news about what Jesus Christ has done to reconcile sinners to God. The gospel is the good news about what Jesus has done to reconcile sinners to God. Um, so four, four things. Number one, the one and only God who is holy made us in his image so that we can know him. Number two, however, we sinned and cut ourselves off from God, from him. However, in his great love, God sent his son Jesus to come as king and rescue us, his people, from our enemies. The most significant enemy being our own sin. As king, Jesus established his kingdom by acting as both a mediating priest and a priestly sacrifice. So he lived the life that we should have lived and he died the death that we should have died on the cross. And by doing this, he fulfilled the law and took upon himself the punishment of our sins, of, of everyone's sin, uh, the sins of the whole world. Then he rose again from the dead showing that God accepted his sacrifice and that God's wrath against us had been exhausted, that it was satisfied. He now calls us, uh, number five, he now calls us to repent and believe, to repent of our sins and trust in Christ alone for our forgiveness. So if we repent of our sins and trust in Christ, we are born again into a new life, an eternal life with God. So in that summary, in that summary of the gospel, that, that broader sense of the gospel, uh, 
I want to zero in here on an eternal life with God because that's going to work. It's going to tie in a little bit here, uh, a little bit later. Um, turn to John chapter number 17. Because we're reading John's letter, um, he refers a lot to his gospel that he wrote, uh, the gospel of John. Uh, so we're going to refer back to this a lot as we go throughout the book. It's going to help explain and bring some clarity to some things. But John chapter number 17, verse number 1, let's read there. John 17, verse number 1 through 3, it says this, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. All right, so here's one of the purposes of Jesus coming, so that he can um, give eternal life to those who trust in him. And this is life eternal. This is important, verse number three. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. What is eternal life? What does he say eternal life is? That they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So eternal life is not just the result of fellowship with God. Eternal life is fellowship with God. In other words, knowing God. Eternal life is knowing God. Uh, look at uh, Jeremiah chapter number 9. You, you can turn there if you want. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse number 23 through 24. It says this, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, and neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. This is God speaking, that I am the Lord, which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. What, what is the glory that we should glory in? That we understand and know God. That we understand and know Him. And He made it possible for us to know Him through the person of Jesus Christ. Knowing and having fellowship with God is not the same as knowing about God. One doesn't know God simply because he or she ascribes to a certain set of beliefs or a certain set of doctrines or a certain denomination. Okay. Uh, now, this is not to say that denominations aren't important, that doctrine isn't important, uh, that we can just throw those out the window and say, ah, it doesn't matter what you believe. Uh, as long as your heart is right with God, that's all that matters. But actually, that doesn't make sense. To, to say that is like saying, oh, it doesn't matter what you eat. As long as you're healthy, it's okay. No, it doesn't make sense. Just as your health is directly affected by what you eat, your relationship with God is directly, your relationship and position before God is directly and much more directly affected by what you believe about God, by what you believe about God. So doctrine is important. Doctrine is important. Um, but the purpose of doctrine is not simply to take up residence in your mind, to be filed away for some future conversation or debate you might have, uh, but rather to penetrate your heart and radically change your life. That is the purpose of truth. That is the purpose of doctrine. It's supposed to change your life. Okay. Uh, number two. So that's uh, number one, the importance of fellowship. Okay. Why are we talking about fellowship? Because it's very much integrated into the gospel, very much a key part of the gospel. Um, but number two, the nature of fellowship. What is fellowship? What is this fellowship John is talking about? Um, this word fellowship that we see here in verse number three and in verse number five, or I'm sorry, verse number six, if we say that we have fellowship with him, um, this word fellowship means to have in common, association, community, intimacy. Okay, so it's, it's rather tight-knit type of association, okay? So when you and I become Christians, what is it that you and I could possibly have in common with God? What could we have in common with him? I mean, he's God and we're not. We're humans and he's uh, what the Bible says, God is spirit. So what is this common thing that we can have, this association, this community, this intimacy? Um, oh, what is there that of us that becomes common with God when we become a Christian, when we um, repent of our sins and place our faith and trust in Christ? Uh, well, there are three things. 
Okay, three things that we share with him, three things that we have in common with him now that we are believers. Um, first thing is this, we share in his life. We share in his life. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3 through 4 says this, according, uh, if you want to turn there, you can. 2 Peter 1, verse number 3 through 4. It says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of what? Of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What, what are we partakers of? His divine nature. Um, now, so when we repent of our sins and trust in Christ as our righteousness, we are given the divine nature of Jesus Christ. Uh, John later in chapter number three puts it this way, that um, we, uh, beloved, now are we the sons of God. The sons of God. Uh, now note, please, <laughs> this doesn't mean that we somehow become gods or exact duplicates of God. Uh, you go that direction, you can get into all sorts of mess. Um, uh, th that's not what that means, okay? Uh, we have become partakers in his divine nature. So, uh, an illustration for you. Uh, we don't become God, and this is a human illustration, so it's not going to be complete or perfect, but we don't become God in the same way that children aren't exact duplicates of their parents, okay? Uh, part of each parent is imparted to the child, uh, the mother and the father, uh, features, personality, uh, you name it. But the child, the child himself or herself does not lose his or her individuality. Okay, they are still their own individual person. Um, so by sharing in his divine nature, we share in his eternality or his eternal life. Remember back in verse number one. Um, I talked about how he was the life, and in the uh, Gospel of John it says, um, in him was life. That life we take part in as Christians. Those who have repented of their sins and placed their tr trust in Jesus Christ, uh, he not only becomes our righteousness, but we now share in his life. Uh, this is very closely tied to the resurrection. Uh, we are given new life because of his resurrection, being, uh, the fact that he conquered the grave. And that one day we will be resurrected with him. Okay, um, this this all plays in together. Uh, but we share in that divine nature. We also share in his interests. That's the second thing. We share in his interests. Um, this point and the next one are going to be based on the first point that I just said that we share in his life. Uh, if you don't share, um, uh, you don't share interests or communication with God unless you first share in his life. There has to be that life transforming moment where you've placed your faith in Christ and the gospel has made you a new creature, okay, where you pass from death into life. That is so key. That has to happen. Um, otherwise, doing the things that God uh, says we ought to do, it, that, that is a works-based uh, salvation. That's a works-based way of living where you are doing so much good so that you can be accepted in God's eyes. Um, it's through Christ that we become accepted. Because Christ uh, was the only one who could pay for the sins of the whole world and satisfy the debt that needed to be paid. It's only through Christ, all right? So um, with that said, another way to say this, that we share in his interests, is that we are given the mind of Christ. We're given the mind of Christ. Um, look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 14. It says this, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. These things are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? This is kind of a rhetorical question. Who, who, who's known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Then he answers the question, sort of here. Uh, but we have the mind of Christ. But we have the mind of Christ. We can spiritually discern these things because we've been given the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. We share in his interests. Um, illustration for you. Uh, 
many of us have a best friend, a good friend, okay? Or uh, maybe a family member that we're really close with, that we know very well, that we share uh, a lot of secrets with, we share a lot of stories with, life events with. Um, how many of you have ever heard a story uh, and seen a, uh, maybe seen a funny video or you saw an item at the store or you read a funny post uh, on the internet and instantly you knew what so-and-so, your best friend, your buddy, would think about it. You instantly knew what they would think about it or how they would react to it. And you instantly had to just like share it with them, like on the spot, share it with them or share it to a group of people that you know would react in a certain way. Um, you see, having the mind of Christ uh, or sharing in his interests is much like that. Okay, in a much greater way, of course, but it's not that you can read his thoughts, not that you know what God is thinking right now, but, uh, and neither does it mean that you've been given like a completely different mind, a different brain, like you have no control anymore and it's just all this new mind that God has given you. No, rather, this is what it is. You know what he thinks about things. You know what he thinks about things. Those things in scripture that, uh, the natural man cannot discern, you now can discern them. You know that these are things that God desires and your desire to please him, your desire uh, to, show, uh, to show him the same love that he showed to us, uh, it, it changes the way that you live. It changes the way that you live and it determines how you live. All right, you know what he thinks about things, okay? Much like um, I know what my wife thinks about certain things. Um, and I avoid doing some things because of the, what she thinks about it. And I want to please her, um, or, uh, a child to a parent. Um, at least most parents would hope that their child would have this kind of relationship with them, but they know what their parents think about it. So they avoid doing it, um, in a much greater way. That's how it is with us and, and God, we know what he thinks. And because we love him and because of the love he's shown to us, we, uh, we are, we are constrained to obey him. We, we can't help but obey him in those things because we know what he thinks about it. Um, uh, a well-known preacher said this, as a Christian, when you hear a story, you're actually hearing two stories. When you experience sadness, you're actually experience, experiencing two channels of sadness. Uh, Christians are always twice as happy and twice as sorrowful with everything. Because when you hear that great story and you get a glimpse of a much bigger story, uh, or you get a glimpse of a much bigger story, which all stories point to. And when you experience sorrow, you remember an even greater sorrow of someone else, of which all other sorrows are only a glimpse. Only a glimpse. Jesus becomes the lens through which you and I see life. As a Christian, he is, he is our lens. Uh, you see what he sees. You see criticism differently. You see lost family members differently. You see your classmates or coworkers differently. Uh, you view this situation, COVID-19, <laughs> being quarantined, okay? Uh, having to stay at home all this time. Uh, you view that differently than the natural man would view it. You view your sin differently. All things become new. Not just things in your life become new, but the way you see things becomes new. Um, and lastly, we share in communication. Uh, this means that your relationship with God isn't a one-sided deal. It's a, it's a two-way relationship. Uh, you speak to him in prayer and he speaks to you through his word and through the Holy Spirit's enlightenment. And this also means that you will want to pray, okay? Because you know him and because you share in his life you, and because you, um, you share in his interests, uh, you're going to want to communicate. You want to communicate with people that you love. You want to communicate with them. Um, and, and it's not just to go down your prayer list and get things, okay? Although that is one of the reasons that we can pray, is that we can request things. But, um, but the reason you pray is because you simply want to spend time with him. You want to talk to him. You want to know him. Uh, that's the difference between being a Christian and a religious person. Someone who's been transformed by the gospel and someone who's just trying to live by a certain set of rules. Uh, religious people only talk to God when there's a crisis or a need. Case in point, what we're going through right now. Um, uh, the religious person is just, 
is going at it and trying to get what he can from God at this point. Um, but the Christian, the Christian uh, takes this trial and accepts it and says, this is, God is in control here. God has this here for a reason. God is trying to refine my faith. Um, and so we don't just run to him and say, you know, please take this away. But rather we run to him and say, comfort me. <laughs> rather we run, run to him and say, um, I trust you. Okay. Our prayers are different. The Christian's prayer is different from the religious person's prayer. Uh, Christians talk to God for God. Nothing more. They don't talk to God to get things. Um, Nobody considers a person a friend who only befriends you or comes around to spend time with you for the sole purpose of getting something out of it for them. That's not a friend relationship. If it's even a relationship at all, okay? That, that, that's, a, that's a horrible way to look at a relationship. What can I get out of this if I take part in it? See, Christians want God for God. They don't want God simply for his things, what he can give them. All right, so last point, number three. So we saw the importance of fellowship. We saw the nature of fellowship, what it means, what it is. Uh, number three, the tests of fellowship. The tests of fellowship. According to verse number five, according to verse number five, God sets the standard of holiness. And this is where we're going to get into these, these verses here, uh, verse number five through seven. According to verse number five, God sets the standard of holiness. If he sets the standard of holiness then how we, you and I, live our lives in relation to his holiness will be the evidence as to whether or not we actually have fellowship with him. Okay, God has set the standard of holiness. And how we live our lives in relation to that holiness is going to determine. It's going to be the evidence to those around us and to ourselves if we really have fellowship with him. If we really have fellowship with him. Uh, remember, John is writing this letter in response to, uh, possibly in response to false teachers who had infiltra infiltrated the church. Um, he's combating a lot of false doctrines here uh, about what people believe about Christ and what they believe about sin. Um, so these are just as much a tool for detecting a false teacher, okay, these tools he's about to give us, um, as they are for self-examination and reflection. Yes, we should look inwardly, but we should also take this and say, hey, this is what um, this is what um, a false teacher is. If they say this, but this is how they live their life, there's a very good possibility that they're not really, they don't really know God. Okay, so this, this could be used to, to combat that. Um, so the tests of fellowship, there are two tests of fellowship. He gives us a negative and a positive. Okay, how we can know that someone does not have fellowship and how we can know they do have fellowship. Okay. So uh, the first one, the first test of no fellowship is, do you walk in darkness or does that person, individual walk in darkness? Uh, look at verse number five through six, it says this in first John chapter one, verse five through six, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light standard of holiness. God is light. Okay. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, when the fact is God is light and that's who he is, then it turns out we're lying <laughs> and we're not doing the truth. We're not of the truth. Um, there are some implications that, um, that come into play when it comes to claiming fellowship. Okay. When we say I have fellowship with God, I know him. I, I know who he is. Um, there are some, uh, but uh, on the other hand, we're walking in darkness, meaning we're living in sin. We're living as if we are the natural man and living a life that's not been transformed by the gospel. We're not doing those things that God says are important and that um, reflect or ought to reflect um, in the life of a believer, um, uh, there are some implications, okay? And he says it here. We are lying. <laughs> We're lying. Um, I, can make, I can make the claim that I know Pastor Lang. 
I can make the claim, hey, I know him. But if you who know him, okay, were to ask me what his first name is, okay, and I were to respond confidently, okay, and I believed it with all my heart, confidently, well, his name is Stanley, of course. You would immediately know if my claim was real. Why? Because you know him, and you know that his first name is not Stanley. His first name is Nathan, right? So, um, uh, or if I were to say he absolutely despises Reese's cups, Reese's peanut butter cups, then you would definitely know that I don't know him at all. Okay. Uh, so when someone claims to know God, but their life is in complete rebellion and opposition to His commands, it's nothing more and nothing less than a lie. It's a lie. Um, now, there are. There are those who can be categorized as false teachers who very purposefully um, know in their heart of hearts that they don't know God and they have no interest in knowing him, but they're spreading false doctrine for their own personal gain. Okay? There are those who have that intention. Now, it's not to say that all those who walk in darkness but also and say that they know God, but you look at their life and say, there's, there's no way that you know God because your life looks like this. And this is what your life should look like if you know God. This is what, uh, this is what a, a Christian should do if they know God. Um, it's very, because it's a lie, okay, uh, we are of, before you and I were Christians, before you and I were transformed by the gospel, uh, we were of our father, the devil, okay, who was the father of lies, Okay? Think about the Garden of Eden and the big lie, the big one, the original lie that was told in the beginning that you can become like God. You'll know the knowledge. You'll have knowledge of good and evil. You'll be just like God. God doesn't know what you need. In fact, he's holding this back from you. Um, he told this lie and Adam and Eve gave in to that lie. And from that point on, death passed upon all men because of that rebellious act of sin. Um, so it's very possible for someone, uh, it, they can be a false teacher, they could be doing this purposefully, or they could be doing this ignorantly, okay? They could be doing this ignorantly. This is why John is writing this letter, because there are some people who don't really know what the gospel is. That gospel that I just explained to you earlier, uh, they're believing in a different one, or they're rejecting Jesus, or they don't think sin is that big of a deal. Um, they think they know God, but they really don't. Okay, so I don't want, uh, or I'm sure pastor and, and anybody else would not want us going around and just calling everybody false teachers who, <laughs> who it looks like their life is not lining up with the claim that they say they know God. Um, we have to understand that some people are believe certain things ignorantly. Okay, they're ignorant of the gospel. Um, that's why it's so very important for us to proclaim the gospel very clearly and concisely. Okay. Um, so that people know what the gospel is, okay? So, when someone claims to know, their, to know God, but their life is in complete rebellion and in, oppos in opposition to his commands, it's nothing more and nothing less than a lie, okay? We show very plainly that we are not of God, but rather our true father, the devil, okay? Um, but here's another implication. We are anti-Christ and anti-God, I told you it was black and white, okay? He draws a line and says, truth, error, okay? Um, this is an implication, okay? If we claim to have fellowship with God, but we walk in darkness, that must mean that we are anti-Christ and anti-God, okay? Um, to give you some clarification here, you and I, before we were Christians, before we came to know Christ, before we were transformed by the gospel, before we became a child of God, we were an enemy of God. We were anti-Christ. We were anti-God. There is no in-between. There is no gray default mode that everybody lies in. And depending on how they live their life, they might tip over into the enemy of God side. No, we are all by default because we were born in sin, enemies of God. Okay? We are all by default anti-Christ and anti-God and pro-me and pro what I want. Okay? That's how we all come out. So anything that is not of the light, holy or righteous, according to God's standard, 
is not on God's side, but rather the enemy of God. This is how serious this is. This is how serious it is to know um, that the gospel you're believing in is the gospel. Okay? Is the true gospel. Um, and that you know God. So, uh, that's the negative. Okay? That is the negative test. But there's a positive test here. Okay? The test of true fellowship. This is how we know that someone has fellowship with God or that we have fellowship with God and that we can assure our hearts that we have fellowship with God so that our spirit uh, bears wit or the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit and comforts us and saying, yes, you know him. Okay. Um, uh, the test of true fellowship, walking in the light, walking in the light. Uh, look at verse number seven. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So what are the implications of claiming fellowship with God and walking in the light? These are the implications. There are two, and he gives it to us in this verse. We share the same fellowship with other believers. If we are in fellowship with God, then we must be in fellowship with other believers. In other words, we show evidence that we are part of the body of Christ. We show evidence that we are part of the body of Christ. We share the same fellowship with other believers. And then second implication, I'm almost done. We are cleansed and freed from sin. We are cleansed and freed from sin. Being cleansed of all our sin means we are no longer slaves to sin. In other words, we're free from sin. Okay? We, we don't have to serve sin anymore. It's not our master anymore. We are no longer under the control of the realm of Satan and the forces of darkness. So as a result, this is an implication. As a result, we will not continue in sin, meaning we will not continue a life um, that is not characterized by repentance. Okay? Uh, and, but we'll live a life of repentance. Uh, that uh, I tell our teens all the time. That's the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. Both are sinners, but one is a repenting sinner. And that word repentance means to turn away. We don't just repent uh, when it comes to um, salvation, uh, coming to Christ. We don't. That's not the only time that we repent of our sins. Okay, we are always repenting. We are always turning away from sin to Christ. From sin to God. Um, the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian, the only thing is that one is a repenting sinner, a repenting sinner, okay? Um, as a result of being transformed by the gospel and knowing God, sharing in that eternal life, we will not continue in sin, okay? Now, we still have enemies. Although we are freed from the realm of Satan, the realm of, uh, of uh, his domain, okay? Um, we still have enemies, Okay. Although the battle has been won where uh, sin, death, hell, and the grave have been defeated through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, it's much like um, if you could think of uh, World War I or World War II. Um, the day that, um, uh, that it was signed that the war was over, did the fighting stop immediately? Did the fighting stop immediately? No, there were still skirmishes here and there. Okay, um, even though and at some point in the war, even though they knew that they were going to lose, okay, even though the enemy knew that they were going to lose, they still fought. Okay, they still fought, and much like that. Okay, although sin, death, hell, and the grave have been defeated, and um, it's as good as done that they'll face their end that uh, that's been coming to them. Okay, they're still fighting. There's still skirmishes that take place, okay? Um, we will sin in temptation because we're still human beings, because we do still live in this flesh that sins. So John is not saying that Christians stop sinning, right? and next week we'll talk about that. Um, if we say that we have no sin or if we say that we have not sinned, um, and then starting in chapter number two, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Um, we don't we don't stop sinning. We don't become perfect all of a sudden. Our stance before God changes, whereas when he looks at us, he sees his son. 
we are righteous in God's sight. Um, he is pleased with us because he is pleased with Christ. Um, part of being a Christian, though, is, is knowing that you are indeed not perfect. Okay? That we are indeed not perfect. But the one that we trust in is perfect. Okay? The one that we trust in is perfect. Um, so it doesn't mean that sin is gone all of a sudden. All right? We still deal with sin as an enemy. Um, but, uh, but we have a hope. We have a hope that one day we will be resurrected just like Jesus was resurrected. One day sin will be no more. One day death will be no more. Um, uh, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? That, that points to a reality now because of Jesus' resurrection, but also a reality we get to experience one day in the future. So do you know God? Do you know God? Based on these two tests that have been given to us um, of walking in darkness while claiming to know God, or walking in the light while claiming to know God. Um, do you know him? Do you share in that eternal life? Has your life been transformed by the gospel where you share in not only his life, but in his interests and in communication with him? Has all things become new in your life? You cannot know him unless you know his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, it's not about simply knowing about God. It's not just ascribing to a certain set of beliefs or to a denomination. It, do you know Christ? Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Have you repented of your sin and placed your faith in Christ to be your righteousness? See, you cannot have God without Christ. You cannot have God without Christ. As a Christian... As a Christian, we share in his interests. We don't just ascribe to a certain set of beliefs intellectually, okay? His desires become our desires. We live for what he says is important. So does the way that you live your life prove that you have fellowship with God? Does it prove to yourself, does it prove to others that you indeed have fellowship with God? It's a black and white truth, okay? And once again, John doesn't do this to hurt our feelings necessarily, okay? He's telling us the truth because he loves us, okay? He's practicing what, what it means to be a Christian, to show love for one another, and to show love um, uh, to do good unto all men. And to do good unto all men is to share the gospel and not to keep it a secret. And he's just telling us the truth. He's telling us the truth so that we can know that we know that we know God. Do you know God? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you do for us, and thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the truth of it. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, use this message uh, that we just heard. Uh, use this passage of Scripture, and Lord, let it dig deep in our hearts. Help us to look inward and to ask the question, um, are we claiming to know you but walking in darkness? And Lord, help us as Christians uh, to look at that and let it uh, change our life. Uh, let it look at what we've decided is important um, and uh, those non-essential things and help us to purge those things from our lives so that we can focus on those things that you say are important, that are your interests, that are your desires, that are your goals. And Lord, if there's someone uh, listening to this that doesn't know you as Savior, uh, that, Lord, they, after listening to this, they can say, well, I don't know you. I don't know God. Uh, Lord, I pray that through the, uh, through the gospel that was presented today, um, that they would realize that they have sinned and that they need someone else's righteousness. And that righteousness is Christ's righteousness. Um, I pray, Lord, that they wouldn't uh, hesitate and they wouldn't put it off, but they would uh, today... Um, repent of their sins and place their faith and trust in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And Lord, I pray that you would be honored and glorified by everything that was said and done this evening. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, that ends our live stream for this Sunday evening. Um, uh, once again, uh, we miss all of you, all of those uh, who are members there at Lighthouse Baptist Church. Um, and if you're visiting with us, uh, if you're watching the live stream for the first time, if uh, if you don't go to our church regularly, then uh, 
Uh, thank you for joining us and, and for listening. And uh, we will see you all next week.